This is Billy Kay celebrating the life of R. B. Cunningham Graham, whose involvement in the early Labour Party and Scottish National Party is still provoking debate. Chris Dixon. I should begin by saying the only party I've ever been a member of is the Labour Party. But the sort of Labour Party that I would identify with would be much more aligned to the views of Cunningham Graham. And I really do think in the current political situation in Scotland, where there is this very false division on the national question between Labour and the SNP, I think it would be really good for Labour to look to people like Cunningham Graham with their strong identification in support of Home Rule. For Labour supporters, the early founders of the Labour Party, like Cunningham Graham himself, the idea that there would be a Scottish Labour leader sharing a platform with the Scottish Tory leader to argue against Scotland's case for national self-determination I can think of an expression my granny would have used. He'd be burling in his grave. And I can just think of Cunningham Graham as being that sort of traditional Scottish socialist and Scottish nationalist who would be burling in his grave at the idea of the Scottish Labour leader sharing a platform with a Tory leader to speak against the cause of Scotland's self determination. And similarly for the Scottish National Party to look very much to that socialist strand. And I do think for that reason he's such a significant figure for contemporary Scotland. But now the final episode in my archive series from 1999 Don Roberto, Master of Life, King Among Men. I joined the National Party in 1932 and the annual highlight was going to Bannockburn. At the head of the procession marching through Stirling was this man on horseback, Cunningham Graham. Of course, he was a born rider and he always looked out of time, if you know what I mean. I could have imagined him quite easily as a cavalier. He just had a very special aura around him. He was slim, he was very aristocratic looking and altogether an absolutely romantic figure. The Scots Hidalgo, the last conquistador, Don Roberto even in his 80s, still cutting a dash and tilting at the Unionist establishment. For in the last 16 years of his life, he devoted himself to the cause of Scottish self-government. President of the Scottish Home Rule Association of the early 20s, President of the National Party formed in 1928, and Honorary President of the Scottish National Party from its foundation in 1934. Elspeth King of Stirling's Smith Art Gallery and Museum, Richard Finlay of Strathclyde University and the eyewitness, Muriel Gibson. He would speak, of course, always at some part of the programme and he always had a handkerchief. I think it must have been silk because it softly flowed out of his breast pocket and he had a trick of turning and looking at the cameras that were waiting to picture him so that just for a split second the camera could have got a good photograph of him without stopping the flow of his words or anything else. I, here and now, rededicate myself to the cause of Scotland's freedom. So long as my strength lasts, I shall continue to advocate an independent Scotland. From a nationalist perspective, it's very important the idea of the lost leader. In some ways, you could say it's almost a kind of quasi-Jacobite thing. Here is Don Roberto, who comes from over the seas with aristocratic blood to lead us to be a nation again. It's never explicitly mentioned, but it's obviously a very important theme. He was at many of the Bannockburn demonstrations, which are always held on the 23rd, 24th of June. He spoke as well at Elders Lee at the Wallace Day demonstrations that take place every August there. And many fine things that he said about Wallace are on record. Wallace made Scotland. He is Scotland. He is the symbol of all that is best and purest and truest and most heroic in our national life. 
so long as the grass grows green or water runs, or whilst the mist curls through the corries of the hills, the name of Wallace will live. Cunningham Graham's ringing patriotic oratory from the Wallace demonstration. One of his guests was the Spanish ambassador, Don Ramon Perez de Ayala. The historic symbolism celebrated by Cunningham Graham, de Ayala had also been the name of the first Spanish ambassador to Scotland during her golden age of independence in the reign of James IV. Don Roberto could symbolise the historic nation and draw from a romantic past, but his increasing nationalism grew out of the economic depression of the 1920s and harked back to his pioneering socialist days of the 1880s. His biographers, Cedric Watts and Lawrence Davis. I'm not surprised by that. He's one of the two founders of the Scottish Labour Party, along with Keir Hardy. He believed in home rule for Ireland, Scotland and Wales in the 1880s while he was an MP. So his membership of the Scottish National Party is an extension of that. He also said that nationalism was the first step to the international goal that everyone must keep in sight. He believed that before you could have true internationalism, it was necessary for previously subjugated territories to gain their independence, to gain their pride. Then there could be equal dealing between the nations. So the socialist goal of internationalism was never forgotten by him. And although he was president of the Scottish National Party, it's noticeable that his sense of humour never left him because late in life he said that Scottish nationalism meant the right of the people to see their taxes wasted in Edinburgh instead of in London. <laughs> I mean, the key thing about Cunningham Graham was that he could give the nationalist movement some degree of respectability. He was a, a famous figure. He was also attracted by this sort of kind of literary nationalism, people like Compton Mackenzie, Hugh McDermott and various others, and that sort of satisfied his kind of bohemian side. He occupied the same kind of position that someone like Gladstone had for the Liberal Party. He was a very important icon, but not very important in the practical day-to-day -day running of Scottish nationalism. Right from the start, he was determined to reject any idea that a home rule Scotland or an independent Scotland would be an inward-looking place, and was determined to forge links and find Scotland's place in the wider world. And he was extremely critical of jingoistic nationalism that emerged, say, during the South African War, which he denounced the whole policy of trying to subjugate other races. Hamish Fraser of Strathclyde University. Cunningham Graham's nationalism was tied in with his desire to see threatened indigenous cultures and ways of life survive into the 20th century. But he always kept a broad perspective. He could rail against British imperialism in Africa, famously calling Rhodesia Frodesia. Yet he was never tempted, as were many Scots, to blame the English for Scotland's plight. Yes, fellow Scots, the enemies of Scottish nationalism are not the English, for they were ever a great and generous folk, quick to respond when justice calls. Our real enemies are those among us born without imagination. The Scots simply had to take responsibility for their own destiny. However, Cunningham Graham realised that others in brutal circumstances didn't have the luxury of choice. Graham, for example, had ranched in Texas and travelled in Mexico when the West was being won from the Indians. In fact, he and his wife had been close to becoming victims of the Mescalero Apache themselves. Yet he realised that it was Native Americans like the Apache and the Sioux who were the real victims, and said so in newspaper reports to a sceptical British public. The buffalo have gone first, their bones whitening in long lines upon the prairies. The elk have retired into the extreme deserts of Oregon. The beaver is exterminated to make jackets for the sweater's wife. The Indian must go next. And why not pray? Is he not of less value than the other three? Let him make place for better things, for the drinking shop, for the speculator, for the tin church. He wrote these letters with a tremendous passion at the slaughter of Indians, also with a sense that the white settlers 
in whose interests this massacre is in a sense being carried out will themselves be the victim of the commercial forces that are behind the US Army's moves and the government's moves. He says that social Darwinism inevitably will take its toll on those people as well as everybody else. That's very much ahead of its time, I think. That sense that people can be both oppressors and oppressed, that sense of the tremendous waste and loss when you get a group of people rising up to defend their rights. Graham witnessed the destruction of a society. His fan, Theodore Roosevelt, asked him to write on the subject, but he was depressed by the sight of his friend Buffalo Bill Cody and once noble Indian adversaries reduced to touring Europe in Wild West shows. His great humanity comes out in his elegy for the chief of the Ogala Sioux, Long Wolf, lying buried in a London cemetery. I like to think, when all is hushed in the fine summer nights and even London sleeps, that the wolf carved on the tomb takes life upon itself, and in the air resounds the melancholy wild cry from which the sleeper took his name. It would be mere justice. But, as justice is so scarce on earth, that it may well be even rare in heaven. T'were better ears attuned to the light footfall of the unshod Caius and the soft swishing of the lodge poles through the grass behind the Travis pony should never open. The long drawn cry would only break the sleeper's rest and wake him to a world unknown and unfamiliar where he would find no friends except the sculptured wolf. Let him sleep on. Like me, you've probably noticed the fee quality of some of Don Roberto's writing. Well, it's still haunting us. Just a few years ago, so moved was she on discovering that sketch that an English lady made contact with the grateful Ogala Sioux who had lost all trace of their heroic chief. Together, they repatriated Long Wolf's body to the plains of his beloved Dakotas. Don Roberto would have been touched. If he haunts anywhere in Scotland, it's the family's ancestral home in Gartmore in Stirlingshire, now run as a Christian conference centre. Peter Sunderland. We've 70 acres left of the estate out of the 110,000 which Don Roberto inherited, but uh, we're hanging on to the 70. And nice at this time of year with the daffodils coming through and the trees that the family had planted are still surviving and in fairly good condition. Really. Are you attracted to his writing? I love it. He epitomises the heart of Scotland, doesn't he? I mean, he loved the people, loved the landscape. And he also had this compassion that Scots have for their fellow man. The original builder of this house came from Kinross and was the father of the famous Adam brothers. William Adam later improved it for Nicol Graham of Gartmore. Now, he was Cunningham Graham's great-great-grandfather and, incidentally, was the only proprietor in the area not to pay blackmail to Rob Roy MacGregor. And then further improvements were made by an architect called John Baxter for Robert Graham of Gartmore. I think it's true that Barnes decided to go with Robert Graham of Gartmore, who was his contemporary, Doughty Deeds, we call him. Do you know about that? <laughs> Shall I explain why he was called Doughty Deeds? He, we have several pictures of him, and he was a great man in Scotland in his day. And he wrote a marvellous love poem. If Doughty Deeds, my lady, please, right soon I'll mount my steed. And so we all thought it was rather a funny poem, so we always called him Doughty Deeds. Anyway, Doughty Deeds was a great friend of Burns's, and apparently the story is that Doughty Deeds was going off to his estates in the West Indies, and he persuaded Burns to go with him. And Burns got as far as the end of the pier at Greenock and then suddenly decided, no, he couldn't face it. Luckily for Scotland, went home and wrote poetry. Don Roberto's great-niece, Miss Jean Cunningham Graham, now Lady Polworth, on just one of the family's many connections with the great and good of Scottish history. Good was always more important than great. Don Roberto said there were only two classes of people, the genuine and the humbug. His friendships extended from Oscar Wilde to the worthies of Gartmoor. Jenny Frame and George Watt live in the village. He was very friendly with John Ferguson, the blacksmith in the village. But I also can vaguely mind him. I'd only be about four at the time, because I used to bump about the Smiddy a lot. And the Smiddy in our village was a big attraction. All the kids, everybody gathered there. 
but uh, I'm sure once Cunningham Graham brought his horses from Ardoch by float over to his friend John Ferguson to be shooed. They knew him as a rebel, and he did the time in the jail down in London. And was it regarded as a good thing or a bad thing to be a rebel? Well, if it was me, I would say it was a good thing to be a rebel, because <laughs> I'm a rebel myself. <laughs> Cunningham Graham was also a rebel against the Cuthie, the provincial and the sentimental depiction of Scotland, which dominated the popular Cale Yard School of Literature in his day. George Douglas Brown rebelled in the House with the Green Shutters. Graham did it in Salvagia. At the street corner, groups of men stand spitting. Expectoration is a national sport throughout Salvagia. Women and children are afraid to pass them by, not quite civilised nor yet quite savages, a set of demi-brutes, exclaiming if a woman in a decent gown goes past, there goes a bitch. As Salvagia had a physical resemblance to Gartmoor, there were one or two local rebellions in print at the time against Cunningham Graham. He loved stirring people up. But when he finally had to sell his estate at Gartmoor in 1901, he felt the pain of separation profoundly and expressed it in a broadie. To bid goodbye to buildings and familiar scenes seem natural, as life is but a long farewell. But to look for the last time on the trees, trees that his ancestors had planted, and by which he himself recognised the seasons, as, for example, by the turning yellow of the horse chestnuts, which he saw from his bedroom windows, or the first pinkish blush upon the broken larch, whose broken top was cased in lead. That seemed a treason to them, for they had always been so faithful, putting out their leaves in spring, standing out stark and rigid in the winter, and murmuring in the breeze. The whispering amongst their branches, and the melodious tinkle of the little burn that crossed the avenue were sounds which, on that last day, pervaded all the air and filled the soul with that deep-seated feeling of amazement that looks out, hopeless and heart-rending, from the eyes of dying animals. When he finally departs, he stops to bid farewell to the oldest worker in the estate, thankful for the lowlander's ability to suppress emotion, when he held out his hand, opened his mouth, but said nothing, and then, looking up with the air of one well-learned in weather lore, said, Laird, it looks like a broad day. Graham's strength as a writer lay in his ability to capture fleeting moments like this. Lawrence Davis of Dartmouth College, New Hampshire. When he tried to define what he was doing, he talked about himself as an impressionist. That is, somebody who was very conscious of his own position as an observer, as a biased observer. He doesn't try to be a neutral eyewitness. It's actually very hard sometimes to tell whether a particular story is quotation marks fact or quotation marks fiction. Again, he's very much ahead of his time on that. There's a furious debate going on now about the amount of fiction in autobiography and the amount of autobiography in fiction. A lot of his work anticipates that. Impressionist painting uh, was in a way a model. It gave you very vigorously rendered standpoints, strange angles. You think of those Degas paintings, for example, where you're looking down or up unexpectedly. You think of those Monet paintings where the light is everything and affects what you see. And Graham is very conscious of that. He's saying, here is life as seen by a quirky observer. And this is a challenge to the ways that other people describe the world. Graham the Impressionist, apt that he should be linked to a school of painting, for among his greatest admirers were painters and sculptors. His image captured famously by Lavery, Toft, Rothenstein, Epstein and others. He's the model for the painting of Sir Walter Raleigh in the House of Commons, which is ironic because his heart would certainly have been with the Armada rather than the English hero. His actions were also compared to those of Don Quixote, the hero of the novel by Cervantes. Few realised that again he had been happy to provide himself as model. Kirsty Wishart, George Bruce and Murray Gregor. Our perception of Don Quixote or Quixot is because Cunningham Graham stood for many artists, including William Strang. So our image of Don Quixote is actually Cunningham Graham. So that's very Quixotic, also very Robertian. <laughs> 
Well, he certainly was flamboyant, romantic, picturesque, a touch of the Spanish grandee, a man of swagger. When he walked into a room, he would go to the mirror and fluff his hair up before addressing people around him. Oh, yes, he was a dandy. <laughs> One of the appeals of him, of course, is he's a man of paradoxes because he was a pioneering socialist, a very militant socialist, the first socialist in Parliament, yet he was also a dandy, an aristocrat, a person with a claim to the throne of Scotland and indeed of England, and yet alongside the colourfulness, the panache, there was in him a pessimism. Cunningham Graham felt that in the long run there's nothing much you can do against mutability and death. Immediately you read Cunningham Graham's words, you're getting back from his description in a curious way something as vivid as the man was vivid himself. The gesture was there, the large, almost flamboyant gesture, but and the big but is this, of course, he was far more than gesture. see Cunningham Graham as a transitional figure, if you like, between, if you like, the parochialism of the writing that had gone before him and the international view of um, the Scottish modernists that you got with the Scottish Renaissance. I valued Cunningham Graham beyond rubies. We will never see his like again. He was unique and incomparable a human equivalent of that pure white stag with great branching horns, the appearance of which, tradition says, will betoken great good luck for Scotland at long last. Hugh McDermott. And I think the great good fortune he's referring to is the long-awaited arrival of a Scottish Parliament, which McDermott and Cunningham Graham and so many others fought for so long. For his contribution to that and so many diverse aspects of our cultural and political life, he deserves our attention and thanks. But even Cedric Watts of the University of Sussex had to overcome prejudice when he tried to promote his book on Graham. He said when he first went to the Observer, the literary editor at that time said to him, but why are you interested, young man, in doing Cunningham Graham? You don't ride horses, you're English, and you're manifestly not an aristocrat. <laughs> and the great thing about this book was the concept of Cunningham Graham being a heroic failure is a nonsense. In fact, it was a great success because much of what he set out to do has now been achieved. Cunningham Graham is an example of the importance of an individual who questions the orthodoxy and who helps push forward change. He did this in giving backing to the emergence of an independent labour movement. He did this in his support for anti-imperialism and questioning the whole point of the British Empire. He did this when he challenged the attempt to drive people into a straitjacket and to turn them into largely materialistic beings. He believed always that there was more to society and more to what people should get out of the world than materialism. As a writer, he changed the shape and direction of fiction and of prose writing in general at the time. As a politician, he spoke up and spoke out on causes on which almost nobody else was speaking up and out. Above all, he's a wonderful disturbing factor in literature or in politics. He loved to shake things up, to move things, to be, as they would say in mathematics, a strange attractor. And Conrad said in 1906, the words you have written shall be read in the future with the disinterested admiration they deserve, your magnanimous indignations and your human sympathies will be perceived as having made their mark on their time. He was the best type of Scot, intensely at one with the local, proudly national and totally international in outlook. And this is reflected in the museums which have collections devoted to him. In Argentina, at Gualicaichu, near his first estancia, and at the house dedicated to his friend, the writer W.H. Hudson, at Kilmes. His reputation in the Argentine was also kept alive by the biography Don Roberto, written by fellow adventurer and horseman A.E. Cifelli. Nearer home, there's everything from gaucho horse gear to his cameo with Keir Hardy at the Smith Gallery and Museum in Stirling. He's one of the great 
figures of Stirlingshire and people are very proud that he's from this part of the world so naturally we have his portrait here along with a whole host of other things including the very plate from his coffin. He died in Buenos Aires in 1936 and this rather beautiful bronze bas-relief was on the coffin. It's absolutely beautiful. It shows one of the muses and there's a lovely lamp which shines out over the inscription. I think that's the lamp of literature and it says, to the eloquent storyteller, the powerful writer Cunningham Graham, the Writers Guild of Buenos Aires, 26th of March, 1936. Uncle Robert went back on a nostalgic visit to Buenos Aires. He was told by his own doctor in Dumbarton not to go because he'd had a bad attack of bronchitis, but he was determined to go. He'd by then made great friends with young Cefele, who wrote his biography, who'd done the marvellous ride from Buenos Aires to Washington. So he went with two special bags of oats for Cefele's horses, Mancha and Gato, and he saw a lot of friends. And then he died in the Plaza Hotel. And then there was a huge funeral because he was tremendously admired in Buenos Aires, chiefly because he'd written so much about the country and made people aware of it. And there was a huge funeral, and the two horses that done the great ride came behind the coffin, and then his coffin was brought home on the ship that he would have travelled home on anyway. And there was a lovely burial on Inchma home with the coffin being taken across the lake in a boat, and it was all very romantic. He'd have loved it. Fortunately, his writing is still there for us, fresh and original, and no matter where in the world it's set, profoundly Scottish. I agree with the journalist, the late Colm Brogan, when he wrote of R.B. Cunningham Graham, no country could have contained him, but only Scotland could have produced him. We'll end beside his windswept monument in Gartmoor with Rennie McCohen. For once, the inscription says it all. In the centre of the memorial is a kind of medallion in copper, which shows Cunningham Graham's face with his striking profile and the hair swept back and looking every inch an aristo. <laughs> and then just below it is a very moving plaque, not a lot of words, but each one of them carefully chosen, and they say so much. Robert Bontine Cunningham Graham, 1852-1936. Famous author, traveller and horseman, patriotic Scot, and citizen of the world, as betokened by the stones above. And the stones above are Argentina and Uruguay. Died in Argentina, interred on Inch Mahome on the Lake of Menteith. Then it goes on. He was a master of life, a king among men. And I think that's a wonderful thing. He was a master of life and a king among men. <laughs>